have ways of making you talk presents The Cauldron by Zeno, read by Al Murray. Chapter 12 Ted Armstrong regained consciousness in fits and starts. First, half his mind awoke to a woolly world in which only one thing stood out clearly. A magazine or grenade, part of his equipment or perhaps his sten, was digging into his shoulder. The pain was sharp and continuous, and when he tried to ease it he found himself trapped by unexplained pressures. He supposed he was jammed in the corner of his slit trench. His left arm and both his legs became focal points of pain, and yet remained in some way detached from him, as if they were artificial extensions of his body. He suspected they had become cramped and gone to sleep. It was the sharp-angled, gritty pressure of the bricks against his face which brought the second half of his mind to life, and then suddenly he knew where he was and what had happened. He opened his eyes. A fine dust ran into one of them and forced him to close it. The other one did not help him very much at first. He could see broken lines and patches of darkness which varied from dove grey to the jet blackness of a closed cellar. And for a while he pondered the shades of sombre colouring. To his right there was light in the movement of air, and although he could see only from the corner of his eye, it seemed like the wind of promise blowing the light of hope into his darkness. He knew now that what he imagined was the side of a slip trench pressing against his back was in fact weight bearing down on him. A sense of claustrophobia for a moment fragmented his thoughts and sent them in scattered search for an immediate solution, but he realised the danger inherent in panic thinking. He must discipline the fear which had poured into him as an accompaniment to the knowledge that he might be trapped. Concentrating on each limb in turn, he made cautious experiments. His two legs were either broken or badly injured in some other way. Any attempt to move them built up pain in them, which swept out in rolling waves up the length of his body. His left arm was pinned at the wrist, but he could move the elbow, although this hurt the shoulder, which was throbbing continuously. It was damp, and when he raised the elbow as high as it would go, he felt warm blood trickle under his armpit and down his ribs. But his right arm was comparatively free and apparently uninjured. Without moving any other part of his body, he started to wriggle it gently. From the elbow down, it seemed completely free, but between the elbow and his shoulder was a weight of brick rubble which prevented him from raising it. He twisted his arm till it lay outside, then bent it, reaching up and towards his body with his fingers. He touched bricks and began to pull at them. The smaller pieces came away at once, and he jerked them away with some short flicking movements of the wrist. Where two or three whole bricks were joined together, he had to push and roll them to one side, and it was some time before his arm was free up to the shoulder. He tired quickly and rested often, but at last he was pulling at the rubble on his neck and shoulders. He pushed the loose plaster away from his face and turned his head to the right. He looked up the stairs to the gaping hole in the side of the tower through which an 88mm shell had come. He could just see the tops of some trees and the fleece-flecked sky to the north where the Dakotas and Stirlings had dropped their loads of ammunition and food into the waiting hands of the Germans. And this made him think of the Eureka and then of Fraser. He tried to call out to his companion. The cracking noise which came from his mouth frightened him and for a moment he felt his mind begin to break up again. He spat and rolled the dust from his mouth with his tongue. He chewed at his cheeks to make saliva, and he licked his lips. When he called again, his voice was more like he remembered it, but it rang weakly in the tower, throwing faint, despairing echoes back at him from the rounded walls, and there was no other reply. He groped down the right side of his body, tugging and snatching at the broken bricks. Pressing down on his hip, he could feel a mass much larger than the rest, and it was only with difficulty that he could work his hand and wrist under it. At first he could make no impression on it, and he had to steel himself to use the weight of his body despite the pain it would cause him. He heaved his trunk and thrust outwards with his arm at the same time, and the relief as the great hunk fell away from him and rolled heavily down the stairs was some compensation for the agony which in a single moment drenched his body in a sweat of pain, so that he called out against it in a thin, plaintive voice. He lay for a long time, recovering from the shock brought on by the pain. He trembled, and the sweat grew cold on his skin. He mumbled to himself over and over again the same senseless words. Oh, Christ! Why? 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 When the answer became clear to him, he stopped. He was where he was, and in the condition he was, largely because of a decision which had been entirely his own. He had not had to join the parachute regiment. 
It had been his own wish, although he was by no means certain what had prompted him to do so. Vanity had played a part. The adulation of his mother and Jean, his girlfriend, the admiration of his father and his younger brothers, had at the time seemed more than enough to outweigh the rather vague promises of increased danger that his action in volunteering had held out. The possibility of it ending in just such a way as this had never really occurred to him. Somewhere in the back of his mind had laid the thought that he might be killed, or more possibly wounded, but not that it should end like this. A mangled body in dirt and filth, a swollen tongue and a dry mouth, a body racked with pain and a mind filled with the fear of death and the anticipation of more suffering before the death he feared came to relieve him of the pain, which increased as more and more of his body came to life under its nagging urge. He had no idea how long he had been unconscious, and with his watch on his trapped wrist, he had no means of finding out. He looked at the hole in the wall. There was plenty of light still. Perhaps he had not been unconscious for very long. At any moment, Lieutenant Bridgman or Sergeant Gorman might return for him. He suddenly felt a lot better. He turned his head and looked at his left arm. His hand and part of his wrist were out of sight under a solid lump of brickwork. He could see a dark patch of blood on the white of his skin, and in one place it had stained the putty-coloured plaster. He brought his right arm across in front of him and attempted to lift the brickwork so that he could free his left hand. He could move the mass a little, but not enough to allow him to pull his hand clear. He thought for a moment and then hunched himself forward on his right forearm. He felt his legs pull clear of the loose bricks which had lain on top of them and was surprised at how little his pain increased. He leaned to the left till his steel helmet rested against the brickwork and with his right hand bearing down on a tread of the stairs, he braced his neck and shoulder muscles. For a moment, nothing happened. Then he felt the brickwork lift and he snatched his left hand out from under it. It looked quite foreign, lying in the dust under his face. Not only did it not seem to have anything to do with him, it seemed unreal altogether, not human or even animal. It was a caricature of a hand, swollen, misshapen, some fingers huge like grey bananas, others unchanged in size but looking ludicrous like rose grafts on a fungus. Armstrong looked away, raising his eyes to the hole in the wall. He felt sick at the thought of what his legs might be like, and thinking of them, he remembered his shoulder. He eased his right hand inside his smock and under his shirt. His exploring fingers felt drying blood and then the wet patch where blood still seeped. One of his fingers touched something jagged which moved under pressure. He guessed it was a shell splinter from the 88mm. It took him a long time to turn over onto his back and sit up. He made a sling for his left hand out of his camouflage veil and he took his steel helmet off. He wriggled his shoulders free from his haversack straps and drank from his water bottle. He lit a cigarette and looked at his legs. The water and the tobacco improved his outlook to such an extent that he no longer thought about death as even a possibility. He sat on one of the steps, his back resting against one of the risers, his legs hanging down over a succession of them, the tread cutting into his calves and thighs. Fraser might be lying dead out of his sight, farther down the spiral staircase, but he thought this unlikely. He looked at his watch. It was nearly four o'clock and almost two hours since the start of the resupply drop. The platoon must have gone, but he could not understand how they would have done so without coming for him. It was possible they had been driven from the area by a German attack, but that was irrelevant at the moment. He was alone, unable to move and badly hurt. It would be very painful, but it was possible for him to get down the stairs somehow and out into the open. North and south of him were two companies of the border regiment, but he did not know how far away they were, nor how far apart they were from each other. Still, he would have to try it, for there was nothing else to be done. He looked about him for his sten. He saw it at last a few feet above him, and alongside it, and half buried in a pile of rubble, he could see the top of the Eureka. He dragged himself up the stairs, using his shoulder and forearm to obtain a purchase on the treads, his broken legs trailing soggily behind him. He reached the sten and spent a couple of minutes freeing it of dirt and cleaning its action and then he turned to the Eureka. It lay on its side, with the top exposed and facing him. It was firmly embedded, and a great hunk of brickwork bore down on it. Armstrong was thankful that that particular piece had not landed on him. He tried hard, but it was impossible to free the Eureka with one hand. He wondered what he should do. If he left it, it might be captured by the enemy, and if it was, it would be the first time that had happened. He looked at the set again, to one side and away from the dials which set the frequency was a diamond-shaped shield held in place by a single screw in one corner. If he pushed this to one side, a small brassard would be revealed, 
and running down from this was a short safety fuse which led to a detonator and the explosive packed in the space around the working parts of the set. If he struck the brassard with the edge of a safety matchbox, he would have four seconds to get his crippled body far enough down the circular stairs to be shielded by the inner wall before the set blew up. He knew he would never make it. He wished Bridgman or Gorman would come back. Or Fraser. What could have happened to Fraser? He could not have been wrong about him. Fraser would never simply have left him in order to save his own skin. Offhand, he could not think of a man in the platoon who would have done that. He could not go and leave the Eureka where it was, but neither could he see what was to be achieved by remaining. He could not defend the set on his own, or at least not beyond killing two or three Germans. At the most, he could by his presence postpone the capture of the secret equipment by minutes. To stay was absurd. There was nothing to be gained by staying. He wondered what Bridgman, Blake or Gorman would do if they were in his position. The possibility of what they might do made him think hastily of something else. He drank from his water bottle again, and wetting a handkerchief, he wiped his lips and eyes. He must look a terrible sight. His mother's face would crumple up if she could see him, collapse suddenly in the funny way it always did whenever any of her children were hurt, no matter how slightly. His father would look grave and suck his pipe, and would turn away, as he always did, from anything unpleasant. He would look very solemn, but he would wait for somebody else to do something. And he would have a good reason for his own inactivity. He always had. He would go to the big untidy living room at the back of the shop and sit behind his paper pretending to think, but in reality avoiding the consideration of anything unpleasant. Real things, other than the everyday chores of his business, was something that Tom Armstrong never allowed himself to think about. And Jean, whom he was going to marry when the war was over, what would she do if she could see him now? It was silly to conjecture because he suddenly knew that her behaviour would depend upon the nature of her audience. It was strange seeing her for the first time as she really was, without any lengthy analysis of what he knew of her character. She was silly, vain, weak and shallow, and if he lived he would no more marry her than he would go back and work in his father's business and listen all day to his stupid pretentious talk. If he lived he would do something real, something which would ensure he spent his time with men like those in his platoon. Real men, whose first thought was not always of their own immediate welfare. Men whom you first respected and then loved because you respected them. He did not want to live with people whom he had to love because of their relationship to him, and then have to spend half a lifetime excusing their behaviour because he loved them. He lit another cigarette and thought about how he would get down the stairs. His hand was returning to life and beginning to throb painfully. His legs were not too bad, provided he did not move them, but his shoulder felt hot and a bigger area around it was starting to burn in sympathy with the wound. He heard the voices very faintly, so faintly that he was not sure whether he had imagined them or not. He stubbed out his cigarette and strained his ears. He could hear them distinctly now, and they were coming nearer, but he could make out no words. They might be either German or British. He felt his pulse rate increase at the thought that they might be the enemy, but when they got nearer to the tower and he knew that they were in fact Germans, his pulse slowed again and he felt very calm. Everything that mattered to him in his life came through to him as if uttered by someone else in clipped precise phrases. The Germans would come to the tower. He could surrender himself, blow the Eureka or open fire on them. His earlier resolution was stupid and unreal. If he returned to England, he would marry Jean and go to work for his father. His character would not allow him to hurt them and it would upset his mother too much if he broke away from the family. He laid the stem down gently on the stairs by his side, and took two grenades from his pouch. Turning to one side, he swivelled the shield and the Eureka, and groped in a smock pocket for a matchbox. The German voices were lower now. He could hear them, almost whispering, at the entrance to the tower, and then jackboots on the rubble. He struck the brassard quickly, and turning, he seized each grenade in turn, and pulling the pins with his teeth, he lobbed them, one after another, down the stairs. He listened, one ear to the sudden scamper of German feet, the other to the faint hiss of the burning fuse in the Eureka. He hoped the grenades would catch some of the Germans, but he knew he would never hear them explode. The fuse in them was the same length as the one in the Eureka. <laughs>